it's really quite an honor to be here on this night. Uh, for the past several years, I've tried to speak at an important Lincoln site on the anniversary of the assassination. And a few years ago, I spoke at the National Portrait Gallery and at Ford's Theater. And it's quite an honor to be here at Lincoln's uh, retreat. And Aaron is right, the, the president was here yesterday on April 13, 1865. And I'm going to do very little reading tonight, but I just thought you might like to hear about Lincoln's last visit to the cottage, uh, <coughs> April 13, 1865. Still a day of business for Lincoln. Uh, in Washington, Lincoln conducted a full day of business. The city was still celebrating Lee's surrender, but the president had plenty of work to do. The war wasn't over. And soon, when it was, he would have to implement his plan of reconstruction for the South. He had visited the telegraph office early in the morning, then had meetings with General Grant and Edwin Stanton, and another with Gideon Wells. The staff sat on Lincoln's horse at the White House stables. And he rode to his summer cottage at the soldiers' home. Monsell Field, an assistant secretary of the Treasury, rode in a carriage beside Lincoln's horse, and they talked along the way. Later, when Lincoln left the cottage and returned to the White House, he rode out several passes, allowing bearers to visit various points south, including Richmond. Then the president, like other Washingtonians, enjoyed the grand illumination of the city. I want to mention the illumination for a moment. Uh, that, in my opinion, was the most glorious single night in the history of Washington, D.C. <coughs> the fireworks, the fires, the torches, the transparencies, large artworks illuminated from behind that people could see in, in the dark were absolutely magnificent. And the reporters claimed that the, the dome glowed like a second moon that had descended upon the earth as a sign of heaven's favor on the Union cause. So I mention this magnificent night just to set tonight in context. Imagine people waking up in Washington this morning, April 14, 1865, having just experienced the most joyous night in America since we won the Revolutionary War. And Lincoln and everyone else in the city, including John Wilkes Booth, witnessed these illuminations. I uh, spoke earlier today at another important Lincoln site at the U.S. Senate. And of course, that place figures so much in Lincoln's life, his brief term, single term as a congressman in the House of Representatives. And of course, uh, Lincoln's corpse lying in state uh, under the great dome after his White House funeral on April 19th. I did want to mention one thing that happened uh, at the Senate when I went there today. Uh, in, in recognition of my talk, Senator Reid gave me this autographed photo of the Senate. Uh, and I understand that tonight, at the end of my talk, Aaron is going to present me with that bloodstained flag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't have to put it in acid-free tissue. I'll take it just as it is. <laughs> and uh, my collector friend, Paul Pascal, has already volunteered to put it in his trunk <laughs> as, we, uh, as we whisk that, that important relic. Paul and I will probably fight later about who owns the flag. But um, I thought I'd mention a few other things that were happening this week uh, that I'm sure some of you are curious about because it's in the news. And then I'll talk a little bit about the new book, why I did it, how I did it, why I think it's the sequel to Manhunt, and what are some of the things I learned while working on this book, and then some of them really surprised me. Uh, several people at the reception asked me, uh, about the movie, The Conspiracy. <laughs> and, and several people asked about the Manhunt movie, so I'll, just, I'll answer that now before I get into the talk in earnest. Uh, Manhunt is going to be a nine-part HBO television miniseries, wow. which is being produced <laughs> which is being produced by David Simon from Baltimore, who produced the television show The Wire, and also created Homicide Life in the Street. And the actor Kevin Bacon and I have sold the Showtime a TV series on the Booth family, which is supposed to be sort of like the Tudors, but set in the 19th century American stage. Uh, 
uh, with all the depravity that characterized the American stage of that time. The Conspirator. I saw it Sunday at the premiere of Ford's Theater. And I'll be speaking about it tomorrow morning with Robert Renter on NPR Morning Edition. My verdict is this. You should all see it. I enjoyed seeing it. No historical film can fairly be judged on whether it achieves 100% historical accuracy. If that's the standard we demand, no films about history could ever be made. And I do think it's important that anyone make any film about Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War period. And so I commend Redford for doing it. The film has a great feeling I, I felt of the similitude and the mood of the Civil War, the mood of, of Washington, D.C. at the end of the war. It airs the issues. Should there have been a tribunal? Should there not have been tribunal? Was Mary Surratt guilty? If so, what was she guilty of? Knowledge of the conspiracy alone to kidnap a president or knowledge of the, the plot to murder the president. Uh, I really took two issues with the film, and this won't spoil any surprises if, if you see it, which you should. Uh, it's slanted too far in favor of Mary Surratt. And it omits one of the most damning pieces of evidence against her, which I won't mention now because I don't want to slow your enjoyment, but you'll see something's not there. And probably the most egregious thing, and it, it's sad for me in a way that this film has come out the week of Lincoln's assassination, because the, the movie is actually defamatory uh, towards the memory of Secretary of War Edmund Stanley, <laughs> who I believe is one of the great unsung American heroes. And when I go to Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown to visit the site of the former tomb of Willie Lincoln, I always make a point of visiting the, uh, the obelisk or the monument to Edmund M. Stanton. And if you haven't done that, I, I would invite you to do that the next time you go to Oak Hill to find the old Willie Lincoln tomb or visit other graves. Lincoln once said, and I'm, I'm simply paraphrasing this now, quote, not quoting it accurately, that uh, Lincoln said that without Stanton, uh, or it is upon Stanton, the waves of the rebellion uh, crash and are broken. And Lincoln said without Stanton, he could not survive. Lincoln certainly viewed him as his right hand, uh, <coughs> despite their disagreements in, in civil life before the Civil War, when Stanton didn't take Lincoln seriously as a lawyer and mocked him at a trial on which they were all uh, counsel. And Stanton rebuffed Lincoln in quite a rude way. And uh, uh, Lincoln uh, and Stanton healed that wrath. And of course, you all know, as supporters of the soldiers' home in Lincoln Cottage, that Stanton was also here. Stanton spent time with Lincoln. They were very close. Stanton was absolutely devastated by the death of the president. And I say, thank goodness, Stanton was the Secretary of War when Lincoln was assassinated. And so bear in mind when you see this film, and you should all see it, uh, that Stanton, the real Stanton is not the Hollywood Stanton. Edwin M. Stanton was a great American, and Lincoln loved him. I'm absolutely certain of that. Uh, but so many people have been talking about the movie this week, I thought I'd just give you my little two cents, uh, that it's worth seeing. But remember, uh, Mary Surratt certainly knew and I believe participated in the plan to kidnap the President of the United States. I feel that alone was enough. What should be the penalty if you, during a momentous civil war <coughs> that has cost the lives of 620,000 Americans, and you decide you're going to kidnap the Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States by violence and hold him hostage? Uh, I know what I think should have been done to her, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if you read her interrogation after her arrest, You'll see how clever she is, how misleading her statements are, how false some of the things she says are. And add to that certain other evidence, uh, and you'll see that I'm not a Mary Surratt uh, supporter by any means, but I do strongly recommend that you see the film. How many Lincoln films are there? <laughs> and, but but I, I think you'll enjoy it. And certainly the film doesn't conceal what the issues were. It, it just perhaps pursues them in a way that I think is somewhat wrong, but, but well worth seeing. Um, the reason I did the book, 
was not because I had it planned or in mind when I was writing Manhunt. I, Manhunt was really the thing I planned to do for years. I'd been interested in the assassination at least since I was 10 years old. I was born on Lincoln's birthday. And I got very interested in the assassination when I was 10, and my grandmother, who was a veteran of the old Chicago tabloid newspaper era, uh, gave me a somewhat unusual gift, uh, which was a framed engraving of John Lewis Booth's Derringer Pistol. Uh, not a baseball mitt, not a bat, <laughs> not a bicycle, but an engraving of a murder weapon. <laughs> and framed with that was part of a clipping from the Chicago Tribune for the morning of April 15, 1865, the morning that Lincoln died. And I remember reading those headlines as a boy. And those of you who have looked at the Civil War newspapers know at that time there was not a broad, horizontal headline across the page. Rather, the left-hand column had a series of descending vertical headlines in bold print. And I remember reading those, the president shot, secretary of state, Seward, stabbed to death. The early reports were that he'd been killed. And Booth, the actor, the assassin, Booth entered the box, cried out, leaped to the stage, cried out the motto of Virginia, ran off into the wings, and, and at that point, somebody had cut off the clipping in mid-sentence. And I remember as a boy thinking, I have to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the story. I still have the clipping. Uh, it hung in my bedroom wall for years when I was a child. Uh, and I'd read about the assassination. I'd been collecting uh, since I was 10, uh, Lincoln autographs and books and broadsides and memorabilia. And I came to write Manhunt really by accident because my grandmother had told me other stories. And, and she loved to tell me horrifying, chilling stories. I remember when I, when I was little, she said, did you know that during the 1893 World's Fair, there was an insane doctor in Chicago who murdered 100 women and dissolved their bodies in acid? And I said, I want to write a book about that. And when I told my agent, who said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do a book about this mad doctor. And my agent said, do you know who Eric Larson is? <laughs> and I said, I do. And he said, I happen to know that Eric Larson is halfway through writing a book, which is going to be called That Work in White City, which is that very story. And then I said, well, I have another story uh, that my grandmother told me. And my grandfather was on the Chicago police force for 40 years through the Al Capone era, through the 1960s protest era. And one day, when I was a child, he came home, and I heard him whisper to my parents, don't let Jamie read the newspaper tonight. <laughs> Which, of course, led me to immediately get the Sun-Times and read the headline, Madman Murders Nine Student Nurses. Some of you might remember the, the notorious killer Richard Speck, who killed those helpless nurses one by one. Well, my agent said, do you really want to write a book about him? And I said, no, he's just too, much, too evil, too much of a... He said, good, uh, no one would want that book. What else have you got? <laughs> and I said, when my father was in high school, at Lane Tech High School in Chicago, teachers used to point to a chair in the classroom, this was during the Second World War, and say, in that chair <coughs> sat Herbert Hans Haupt, one of the Nazi saboteurs landed by a U-boat on American shores. Uh, Haupt was arrested before we could do any espionage or sabotage. And he was executed. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. It's a story set part in Chicago. It's World War II. My father told me about it when I was a boy. And I mentioned that to my agent. And he said, I have to tell you that not one, but three authors are now writing three separate books on the Nazi saboteurs. And he said, what else have you got? And I said, well, my other favorite story involves the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, our first murdered president and the frantic 12-day chase for his killer. And I said, and then there's a story set in World War II, and that's about, he said, go back to that Lincoln <laughs> thing. He said, are you telling me it was the first attack on a president, and for 12 days the nation had no idea where his killer was, and everyone was hunting him down? I said, yeah. He said, if you like that story, would you consider doing that one? And so that's how I came to do the manhunt. And that was really the culmination of a lifelong of collecting and thinking and interest. I did take a couple of years to do the book, but I had sort of written the book in my head for years. 
It was the book on the assassination that I had always wanted to read and that no one had ever written, to my great surprise. Uh, there are 15,000 titles on Lincoln, maybe even more now. And at least several hundred books somehow touch on or relate to or are about the assassination. But it's, it, I own most of them, and uh, not the 15,000, you know, 15,000. And I realized that no one had told the story the way I had always wanted to read it. So that's why I did Man Hunt. So I really viewed it as the culmination of my interest in the subject. Uh, and then I did the children's book on it uh, for young readers. But at events where I spoke about Man Hunt, uh, a number of people would say, well, what happened next? You mentioned in one sentence there was a chase for Jefferson Davis. Or in one paragraph you mentioned that at the time Booth was being trapped and shot in the barn, people were lining up in Albany, New York on April 26th to view Lincoln's corpse. So what else is behind that? And I started to think about things I wished I could have put in that hunt, but there was just no space for it. And I really decided to do the sequel one day when I was visiting Oak Hill Cemetery. And I'd been to the, the tomb where Willie's body had once lain, but uh, I saw something new that day. I, I realized in my readings that one of Jefferson Davis's little boys had been buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. And I decided on a particular day to also find the former location of that grave. Like Willie Lincoln, his body was ultimately taken away and buried elsewhere. And I found the plot number and the location number. And I was searching for it. I realized I was getting closer and closer to the Willie Lincoln tomb. Until I realized that for Abraham Lincoln, to come and visit Willie's tomb, which we know he did, he would to have passed within 15 feet of the grave of one of the sons of Jefferson Davis. Mm -hmm. And that juxtaposition just struck me as deeply moving and sad, which is why those of you who have read Bloody Crimes know that I actually opened the book with a brief prologue that begins at Willie Lincoln's tomb, because that's really where the journey of this book began for me. And so I decided to do uh, the sequel. And I then decided I should do both these stories in one book, because I came to realize, at least it was my opinion, that three great journeys took place in April and May 1865 at the climax of the Civil War. The first, of course, was the assassination of President Lincoln in the pursuit and capture of General Spook. The second journey was the magnificent Washington, D.C. funeral rites and the funeral train that took his corpse across the country. And the third journey taking place simultaneously with the assassination of events and then the funeral was the flight and escape of Jefferson Davis from Richmond and his ultimate capture and then the long twilight after story of Davis. And so I decided to combine the last stories in, into uh, two books, uh, partly because in the, at the end of their presidencies, both Lincoln and Davis left their White Houses. They were both on the move. They were both traveling with troops and both trying to desperately uh, bring the war to a close, one way or another. And so that's really why I did the book. Uh, one of the interesting things to me in doing it were some of the parallels between Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. And I'll just mention some of them now. And certainly at the beginning of the book, I knew Lincoln better than I knew Davis. And by the time I finished doing the book, I decided that Jefferson Davis is, is truly one of the lost men in American history. Uh, we remember a little about him. We don't think much about him. Uh, in 2009, of course, there was the 200th birthday of Abraham Lincoln, which was celebrated prior to the birthday with, with a special White House dinner in honor of Lincoln, sponsored by the Bushes. Apparently, the first Abraham Lincoln dinner ever held at the White House in honor of Lincoln. A uh, hundred books were written. There were several television documentaries. There were symposiums and events all over the country. Compare that to coins. Stamps. Compare that to another bicentennial of 2008, 
How many people even remember that 2008, June 3rd, was the 200th anniversary of the birth of Jefferson Davis? Uh, there were no White House dinners, there were no coins, no stamps, no flurry of publishing. Uh, one documentary that was shown on PBS regionally and not nationwide. And he was truly a lost figure. Here are some of the similarities. Imagine two men born less than a year apart in Kentucky 